Uh, and good morning, everybody, or good afternoon at this point. Uh, I saw today a headline in one of the trade publications that comes out daily on my BlackBerry, and it said that Africa is now the new destination focus for private equity in particular. And this is true in traditional industries of oil and gas and resources, telecom, other infrastructure, uh, but also in uh, consumer products and um, other areas of investment that maybe are new for Africa. Uh, and we, we have been contacted by investors in restaurant business and in branded uh, apparel. So there is a great focus on investment in Africa, and I'm pleased to say that we have a very distinguished panel to address the key issues of how investors can protect their investments against some of the unique and maybe not so unique risks present in Africa. And what I'll do is I'll make a, a short introduction for all of our panelists. Their bios are in the book, and, and many of them are well known to you anyway. Um, and then each of the panelists will make a five-minute presentation, and then we'll open it up to questions um, from the floor. So the first of our distinguished pan panelists is Colin Melvin. He's the CEO of Hermes Equity um, Ownership Services, uh, and he provides advice to institutional investors in public companies, and that's, that's the focus of, uh, of his remarks. Then Bimpy Kanchu, who's the who is dual qualified, a lawyer. She's qualified here in England and Wales, and she's also qualified in Nigeria. And she is a director of the Lagos Court of Arbitration, which is a new regional arbitration center in West Africa. And uh, we have Sherry Blair, CBEQC, who's well known to everybody here, and um, in her new role as founder and chairman of Omnia Strategy, LLP, which is present in London and Washington and provides strategic advice to governments and investors. Uh, Yui Akpata, who is a partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC. He's the regional head for PwC in Nigeria and West Africa. Lord David Treisman, who is, uh, has a long distinguished career in government and uh, the private sector. He's director of Salamanca Group, Merchant Bank and Risk Mitigation, and he's the former Minister for Africa of the UK government under Prime Minister Blair. And Stephen Fox, who's the CEO of Veracity, their advisor on political corruption and reputational risks in emerging markets, and Stephen is um, located in New York but has offices uh, in many places around the world. And if we could start, Colin. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and, and thank you uh, to the organizers and uh, I should say it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you all. Um, I work in, in investment, uh, but from a particular perspective. So I represent shareholders, mainly pension funds, in engagement with the companies they invest in. The key message here being that as an investor in public markets and listed companies, it's possible also to get involved, to call companies to account, to encourage their better behavior uh, which should lead to an improvement in their value over time. So companies of owners, those often, owners are often absent and we act to look uh, and to behave in a responsible way in, in relation to the companies that our clients invest in. Um, we have $200 billion in assets under advice across 41 pension funds. Um, most of those pension funds invest into Africa or invest in companies with operations in Africa and we're very interested in the operations and the activities of those companies. Uh, we push for better governance, uh, better accountability, more openness and transparency by companies on the understanding that leads to a better economic outcome, both for the countries in which the companies are operating uh, and also uh, for the investors themselves. Um, we heard from Unilever earlier, and one of my favorite quotes in this area is for, from Paul Pullman, uh, who's the chief executive of Unilever. Uh, Paul. Um, often speaks at conferences and talks about uh, responsible behavior by companies. And the quote is, good businesses understand that they can't succeed in societies that fail. 
uh, which I think is, is a very strong message to give from a corporate perspective, but you can turn that around for the investors as well. It's no longer acceptable, in my view, for investors simply to trade securities and sit back and wait to see what happens. We have a, an opportunity as investors and public companies also, particularly working together, to promote their better behavior and thus their better performance. And that can also work at, uh, at regulatory level. It can work at market level. So um, we often at Hermes engage with stock exchanges and regulators to encourage better regulation around governance and openness and transparency. We look for companies to, to produce reports which say something of themselves and the way in which they operate and look for their good operations. Um, there also have been very encouraging developments around and amongst exchanges. I, I think of uh, perhaps the Turkish exchange also in, in Brazil, and I'd like to see this happening in Africa also, where they, they set aside a separate segment of the stock exchange with higher governance practices, higher standards of, of accountability and transparency. That leads companies to, to list in those exchanges, attracting a lower cost of capital, seeing a market benefit from better governance and sustainability. Uh, and openness and transparency, and, and that sort of thing I think would be very, very good to see in more, more African markets. The kinds of things my team does, we have uh, a team of 26 people full-time, we have six advisors part-time, and we engage with the chief executives, chairman, board directors of companies around the world, including companies operating in Africa. We push for better disclosure, uh, better governance, as I said, also better treatment of the workforce, better risk management by companies, um, we look at competition for water resources, for example, amongst mining companies in Africa. We also look for better uh, communication and engagement with workforce around labor relations type issues. So those are the sorts of things we deal with. Um, one of the key things for us is getting access at the right level with companies and working with coalitions of investors. So we work with CalPERS in the US, CalSTRS, the Norwegian Government Pension Fund, some of the world's biggest investors. We sit alongside them engaging directly with companies to promote their better behavior and performance. We assess the impact of issues. We assess also the extent to which companies are engaged with communities and communication and promotion of education, development of resources and staff. We also look at that and encourage that. So the key point then for me is that as a, a, an investor in public markets, um, don't simply sit back. Uh, if you are an investor, if you're trying to encourage investment in, try to encourage those investors to get involved in discussions and debates with the companies they're investing in. That's to all of our benefit, because by working together we can promote a better economic outcome as, a better, as well as a better social and environmental one. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as a follow-on to um, Colin's talk, I think it's important um, that as a lawyer and arbitration practitioner myself, it's important to ensure that um, investors who are looking at Af Africa are aware of the changes, the improvements to the legal frameworks that are available. It may seem obvious, but a well-drafted dispute resolution clause should be at the heart of any business agreement even more so when doing business in Africa, where from the perspective of a foreign investor, dispute resolution can be a difficult hurdle. While the African continent continues to attract foreign investors in various sectors, there are still major concerns with the effectiveness of available dispute resolution mechanisms, particularly the alternative solutions available outside of the courts. By this I mean alternative dispute resolution, ADR, arbitration, mediation, and you might find me using those words inter interchangeably. The topic I've been asked to deal with raises the question of whether African countries are equipped to deal with the inevitable increase in the number of disputes that will follow the increased level of investment. As investors flood the continent, I'm sure that one of their concerns and the risk management issues they have to deal with would be the risk that their contracts are not upheld, or the risk that if there's a dispute, perhaps, any award or judgment that they actually get in their favor are not upheld. Therefore, African countries have to do a lot more on the ADR scene. African countries already are not strangers to ADR. Indeed, numerous countries have adopted international arbitration legislation, often based on international rules 
such as the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, which is UNCTRL, and I will use UNCTRL most of the time, rather than the whole name. 10 countries, including Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya, Zambia, and Mauritius, have, have the, actually their arbitration laws based on the UNCTRL model. Many countries have also signed bilateral and multilateral treaties, providing for investor protection in the member states. 26 countries in Africa have acceded to the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. Now, the, the aim and the, I think the idea behind all the conventions and the, um, the laws I'm talking about are that the international laws that have been set up many years ago, some of them in the 50s, to ensure investor protection, to ensure a level playing field for investors who are going to various member states. And by actually acceding to those, those um, conventions, the African countries are saying the message is we're here to do business in the way that you're familiar with, in the way that you're comfortable with, and we will ensure that we actually uphold our own obligations in any contracts we enter. Now, the African countries who are serious about um, arbitration have obviously need to make significant investments in ensuring that arbitration centers exist. The main issue at the moment is that a lot of the arbitration and um, alternative dispute resolution that's going on, even between contracting parties where one is an African country or African company, tend to go off to far-flung places like Paris, Singapore, London. Nothing wrong with those places. I live in London, I work here. But I also must say that it's more and more expensive for the parties to actually get on the plane and get their disputes resolved elsewhere, especially where the transaction emanated on the continent. I'm going to say very quickly a few words about the Nigerian experience of arbitration. I'm dually qualified. I work here, but I'm also a Nigerian lawyer and I practiced there for many years. And as a director of the Lagos Court of Arbitration, I'm actually, I think, well positioned to understand what investors are looking at, especially when they're looking at the legal framework of the country that they're entering, especially Nigeria, which I must say is obviously a destination because it's the size of the economy. Now, the Nigerian experience is that Nigeria is um, a signatory to the New York Convention, so you can enforce your um, arbitration awards in Nigeria or against Nigerian companies. The, currently, the um, relevant legislation in Nigeria is actually modeled on the UNCTRAL model law that I mentioned earlier. Nigeria also ex has acceded to the ICSID um, Convention, which is another for forum for settling disputes, especially where one of the parties is a country, and this is investor state arbitration. Now, Nigeria is also the home to the largest body of international arbitrators. The membership of the um, Nigerian, um, excuse me, Nigerian Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the Nigerian branch is actually 1,600 Nigerian arbitrators are lawyers who are trained as such, and therefore for any investor coming into the country, he will find a ready body of lawyers who are aware and who are familiar with the actual laws that um, are relevant to him. The other relevant centers are Kigali um, and Mauritius. And I think just before I sign off, because I can see that my time is up, and I'm sure we'll have a few more minutes to discuss this um, later on, I know that one of the main areas of concern, even though we have the arbitration centers, we have the laws, we have the treaties, is enforcement. And this is an area in which I think that the African government still have a lot to do to ensure that the investors still feel comfortable because obtaining an arbitration award is one thing, enforcing it is yet another. And on this note, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and can I say how delighted I am to be here today at a time when Africa is offering such an exciting range of business opportunities. Um, I loved, thank you for, for your remarks about businesses not succeeding in countries that fail. This is something I believe in passionately, and I think it's something that anyone investing in Africa has to be aware of. But you know, we talk about Africa as though it's one place. Africa is not one place. Africa is a continent with many 
different countries and business models and practices designed for other markets are not going to have necessarily the same results in Africa and in fact what works in West Africa may not work in East Africa. What works in North Africa may not work in Sub-Saharan Africa because Africa has different regions, different countries and different cultures. And when I advise international companies about managing their African projects and operations, I point out that Africa is very much about practice. It's not just what you say, it's what you do. And like anywhere else, international expansions or investments have to be carefully planned. This requires informed financial, commercial and legal considerations, of course, but it also involves cultural, economic and political insights. So the first thing, if you're going to invest in Africa, you should do is find the right partner. Because it's not only crucial to be able to navigate relevant international regulations and assess commercial risks, but you've also got to find the right local partner and engage with local stakeholders throughout the process. They are going to find a, play a key role in helping new market entrants navigate local administrative procedures, meet the regulatory requirements, and engage with local stakeholders. So having sector experience is simply not enough. Companies have to also conduct due diligence and make sure that those partners have the experience, yes, but they also share your common values, your visions, and objectives. Because however good someone is technically, if they don't share your values, then things can go wrong. Of course, there are challenges investing in Africa, whichever country you invest in. Some risks are inherent to local financial, economic, or political context. Volatile currencies, the huge problem of corruption, lack of transparency, weak institutions, and limited capacity to enforce the rule of law, etc. And you're so right to talk about uh, how important international arbitration is, but also so right to point out that if you don't have proper enforcement mechanisms in countries, you will get what happened to a client of mine that I was advising recently who got a fantastic award. They won the arbitration, and the defeated uh, local company simply said, well, that's fine, but it'll take you 10 years to get any money out of us through our court system. That's a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. Promoting good corporate citizenship is key. Yes, Africa's economic success story is now here. But Africa has to take the key decisions that will assess its future path. How does it manage its resources? How does it translate economic growth into genuine human development? And that means the people, every single person, on the continent of Africa? How are we going to return good social returns for each and every man, woman, and child? So legal considerations are an important part of that. I believe passionately in the value of the rule of law. But you also have to look at the social and human rights impact of what you are doing. That involves continuous engagements with local communities and stakeholders, and then by looking into that, going back to the remark about countries that fail, your investments are going to be more secure. So for example, when uh, my company Omnia Strategy was it, approached by a mining company who had a security issue, their workers were going on strikes, they wanted to know about their legal rights in that situation. But I said, well, have you thought about why the workers are striking and how possibly we could fix the underlying problems? Because if you can fix those, you won't have the security issues and you'll get more productivity out of your workforce and profits for your stakeholders. So there are ways to prevent some of these risks from ever happening. Adopt efficient corporate policies, conduct regular need and impact assessments, implement 
corporate social responsibility programs and provide training and capacity building whilst engaging with the local communities. Investors all around the world, corporates, political leaders are aware that there's a positive impact that responsible businesses can have on the community and environment in which they operate. So I urge investors in Africa to integrate these considerations in their business strategies. This is the only way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. Um, earlier this month, I spent 30 years anniversary being in PricewaterhouseCoopers. 22 of those years as a partner. Um, and 22 of those years, is, there's this balance of standing between regulators and investors and understanding the state of play of um, different things. So having sort of like 22 years experience and trying to, of doing business in Africa and Nigeria particularly, I'm talking in five minutes can be a challenge. But hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I'll try and throw some, one or two things out there that I think will be useful. It's been stated, the tone has been set today very clearly that it's not about going to Africa, what you will do when you come to Africa. Uh, what you do when you come to Africa. What, I mean, the government of today, in the 54 or so all African countries, recognize that the people want dividends of democracy. So the tone is clearly set that they will cooperate with anyone who is willing to do good business in Africa. Um, a lot of things have been said about what are the challenges and what are the opportunities. I can talk from my perspective, but I think the platform to have this discussion should be based on a PwC annual survey that we conduct of CEOs operating in Africa, what are your challenges and how do you overcome them? And the latest of that just came out last month. It's, um, on the, it's called the Africa Business Agenda. On that basis, I'll talk about the three key things that came out from these um, CEOs. The first challenge is obviously infrastructure and of course the implications when it comes to increased costs. Um, at the end of the day, this is where everyone believes government needs to play its own fair share. But having said that, we see a lot of situations where as part of their strategy, companies are seeing how you can also play a big, a big role. The second one is that perception, or in some cases, actual situations where you see over regulation or changing the game midway as you go along. That is taking a lot of, I mean, at the end of the day, you cannot plan without um, sort of like fi fixed rules. And the last bit is on developing capacity, local capacity as it were. 15 years ago, it was more expensive to get an expatriate American management staff in one of the IOCs operating in Nigeria. Now, it's more expensive to get a Nigerian expat to satisfy the local content requirement. So if you're coming to work in Africa without that investment, then I think um, we'll be losing um, the basis for being there, in, uh, in the, as, the, as the Americans say, from the get-go. How do we overcome all of this? Um, I think at the end of the corruption, I don't want to say it's an issue of perception. It's there, but governments are changing. 15 years ago in Nigeria, PwC would not do work for government. Now, we can't do survive or grow in Nigeria without working with government. Those are the kind of changes we are seeing. And across all the, vari the various countries, when we talk about regulation, you cannot come without understanding the real play or state of things as it were. Then we talk about one key area in Africa, the issue of local content and local participation. If you are coming to Africa saying you just want to invest, grab your money and go out, let's forget it. Come in and actually invest and that particular sector will be better off for it. One of the key success stories of Nigeria in the last year or so, in the last two or three years, has been the success of local content 
in the oil and gas sector, where there are more players rather than individuals um, or companies um, taking control, but everyone is now fair game. And I think lastly, let me end on this note about partnerships. Years ago, you come to Africa and say, okay, if I pay my taxes, that's the end of the story, but now you need to be really engaged with stakeholders, particularly taking something back to the community. I was in Accra on Wednesday um, this past week, and um, Tolo Oil was um, handing over a golf course to the um, community. And you could see the passion in terms of giving something back to the society. And based on the interactions with everyone, everyone was saying Tolo Oil was seen more as a blessing or contribution to the Ghana economy. So that's how the individuals, the community, should see any potential investor as partners in progress, as it were. Coming to Africa is not a lottery. Most people think that way because at the end of the day, you see maximum returns. If you come to Africa thinking it's a lottery, then you'll be like me, who comes here every year to the UK, spending 200 pounds, expecting to win the lottery, <laughs> and not exactly being successful. And because I'm very a good Christian, I pray over it and say, oh God, please help me, this was me. And most of the time, I'm not, I said, okay, anyway, God's going to punish me. He's not going to allow me to win or get win this lottery. But at the end of the day, I pray back. I say, oh, please, God, forgive me. I think I should win. But at the end of the day, my prayers are not answered. Let's do the proper due diligence. Africa is a place to be. And I'm sure at the end of the day, uh, we'll take maximum advantage of the opportunities. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, ten years, nearly 10 years on from the Glen Eagles conference. It makes me feel that this is a meeting that's long overdue. So it's, uh, it's very good to be here. Uh, Salamanca is uh, a merchant bank, rather a traditional, conventional form of banking, uh, very, very strongly involved in uh, direct investment in the deployment of private capital. And its merchant banking is assisted, I think, by the fact that it also has a risk mitigation, a risk um, operational business. And that enables us to try to uh, enable business, to make sure it happens well, to protect the assets of the people we work with and our own assets, and to grow uh, capital. And I put these things together because I think that this morning's sessions have illustrated one thing very strongly. And that is that when people are considering investment in Africa, they are looking at a particular pattern, uh, as Cherie quite rightly says, in a number of different countries, the, the continent is not a country, looking at a number of different patterns of risk, and with that pattern of risk, as many speakers have said this morning, different patterns in the cost of capital. Different issues about the duration of investment because many of the investments need to be very much longer term than the business models of very many of the investing businesses tend to operate. And we formed the view uh, a while ago that if we were to deal with these things properly, if we were to make investments and to advise on investment in a way that was proper and effective, we should ask ourselves a question which it appeared to us many of the people we work with simply didn't ask. Sometimes people come along and say, we believe that Kenya's economy is going wonderfully, we think we'll invest there, and we say, what do you know about Kenya? And the answer is, the economy seems to be going along very well there, and that's not enough of an answer, if I can put it in bold terms. What you really need to do is to take what we call a clear view, not just to analyze business conditions in very great detail, not just to analyze the structures in which you'll invest, which include all of the legal structures, of course, but to also ensure that you analyze out in detail the political structures, the expectations you might have in the political environment over a period of time, the diplomatic systems. Uh, the thing about uh, many investors uh, from this country is they do make the assumption that everywhere, everywhere is the same and everybody has the same cultural systems and value systems, it's never true. The thing about foreigners is they're foreign. The thing really that you have to grasp is they think differently, their culture's different. It's often true their food and their music and many other wonderful things are different. 
and it really serves us well if we can begin to try to understand those things in depth. And also, finally, the fifth of the legs of this view that we tried to take is what we call the ground truths. Um, Salamanca sounds Spanish, actually it's very, very uh, English, very British, uh, and many of the people who formed it came through the military. And their view about uh, understanding the ground truths, the real conditions in which you're going to work, is absolutely fundamental. So I suppose I want to start by saying here this morning that unless you take a really hard, sophisticated view, you will probably fail to make the right investments or you will frighten yourselves away from making any investments. It is worth doing the background work and the due diligence with real thoroughness. As a result, and working in, uh, in Africa, we have uh, offices in Libya, in the DRC, in Ghana, in South Africa, in Mozambique, and we're now exploring the possibilities of opening what I think will be a significant office in East Africa. At the heart of it is that we want to say with our own investments, investments that we help make for individuals and families, for corporations, for sovereigns, and indeed for governments, that we've really tried to understand what we're doing, where we're doing it. And if we do, we're likely to be successful and we're likely to be able to help in the countries that we go to. The point about not just rolling up, thinking it's a couple of years and then you're off with a considerable profit, that's no way for merchant banking and it's no way for anybody who believes in the depth of relationships and the depth of partnerships being the key to success. Thank you. Good afternoon. My fellow panelists and most of you sitting here today are too sophisticated to believe that doing business in Africa is impossible. But there are still many financial investors and companies who allow old stereotypes of corruption to represent a brick wall. Seeing the world from a different vantage point can be useful. New York Times journalist Howard French notes in his new book about Chinese migrants coming to Africa, quote, I was struck by how Africa, to so many of them by contrast with China, seemed <coughs> remarkably free and brimming with opportunity, unlike home, which they often described as cramped, grudging, and hyper-competitive. For many of them, Africa also seemed relatively lacking in corruption. Turning to Tanzania, investors have many concerns, often driven by worrying media headlines on political risk, regulatory uncertainty, and increasing militant threats. The on-the-ground reality is far more nuanced. Negative perceptions are based on a vibrant media and lively political debate. The underlying reality is far different. We believe that Tanzania has an absolute commitment to protect investor rights and a strong political culture for forging consensus among the country's multiple stakeholders. It's crucial to understand the complex processes at play in Tanzania or elsewhere. Private equity and institutional investors, corporates and others should be concerned about corruption, but these concerns are far from insurmountable. In fact, many investment opportunities are no more challenging in Africa than a range of other markets. For example, Tanzania comes out roughly on the transparency index at the same level as Russia. A number of countries come out far ahead of China. And one or two African countries, including Botswana, come out ahead of some countries in the European community. Investors can be over-reliant on Transparency International's rankings, combined with sensational media headlines. Are there rules by which to assess risk? Absolutely. On large-scale infrastructure projects, it's important to take a multi-dimensional view of stakeholders and where problems may emanate. These could come from the national level, at the local level, from NGOs and community groups, and even from neighboring countries. In the resource arena, the concept of free, prior, and informed consent is gaining traction. While that's a whole topic in and of itself, it may practically mean that just because a deal has been agreed by a government in the capital, local groups may not be on board and may try to take legal action against a given project. At another level, 
labor issues can impact projects across a range of sectors, especially when disputes arise not over wages per se, but about allocation of jobs. Those from the capital may be taking jobs that locals believe should go to them. Again, dynamics can be complex and need to be understood both at a national and at a very granular level. Having looked at several hundred potential opportunities in Africa, the number one takeaway is surprisingly simple. Ask lots of questions. Doing your homework on the ground and in advance can save lots of headaches later. As Ronald Reagan was fond of saying, trust but verify. As a native New Yorker, I'm sometimes known as being overly blunt. Both in London and in parts of Africa, such directness may not be a good thing. Nonetheless, there are two groups we have observed that sometimes have trouble asking the tough questions needed to avoid problems down the road. First, some African governments themselves, either deliberately or due to a lack of internal capacity, wind up agreeing to deals with nefarious characters. Secondly, bankers, and I know there are some of you in the room, but not from Salamanca, from time to time we see deals that have not been vetted by bankers, which are in turn shown to hedge funds and other investors that boggle the mind. The proposed party may have a radioactive track record, the deal itself may be fraught with problems, or the warning signs of corruption may be lurking just below the surface and could be revealed with the slightest amount of digging. Africa remains one of the world's most attractive growth regions as we've heard this morning. Up to a million Chinese have already voted with their feet and migrated to Africa. For our part, we see more requests for due diligence in Africa than anywhere else. While the investment community is gushing with enthusiasm on Africa, and we share this optimism, we are also realists. To succeed in Africa requires patience and a broad perspective. Protecting your rights and avoiding corruption are fully possible, but depend on asking smart questions and digging deep to understand the whole story. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was very enlightening. I I'm conscious that we're pressed for time, and I would like to take questions from the floor, but if I could take the uh, moderator's prerogative and ask the very first question. Uh, and, and I'd like to ask it to, um, to Sherry Blair to start with. Uh, earlier today, we uh, had the pleasure of listening to a panel of national leaders from various African countries. Um, and heads of state. And I wonder from the standpoint of an investor or advisors to investors or advisors to governments, uh, what would you tell them? What do you want to tell them in order that they should do in order to attract investments into the various countries? Well, obviously, I'm a lawyer, so I think the rule of law is absolutely vital to that. But if I was to give the presidents themselves one piece of advice, I'd give them the piece of advice that my husband gave himself, which is that no one should stay on as leader for too long. And uh, that two terms, 10 years, is, is a good time to serve your country without becoming too remote from the problems that affect the ordinary people. And therefore, uh, we mentioned Tanzania. I know in Tanzania that the, you can see one president following another president same in Ghana, uh, we, could, we could name Nigeria. President Ozobanjo himself is, of course, an example of someone who has not only stood down from being president, but has made a, an amazing contribution to his country thereafter. Um, this is the way ahead for Af Africa, and so that's what I would say to the president. Thank you. Lord Treisman, would you like to answer the question? Um, I, I strongly agree with those, uh, those points. Uh, but the other thing which came through very strongly to me listening to the presidents and prime minister uh, in the first session this morning was that it's very important to uh, set yourself uh, goals that are realistic. If what you want to do is increase the supplies of energy and you don't want to pay a market cost for it, but you want people to come in with whatever capital they have to develop it, then somewhere or other this circle has got to be squared. The, the finances have got to be genuinely realistic, or the sad truth is no one will do it, and no responsible advisor in finance would advise them to do it. 
uh, trying to mix up, for example, uh, aid and uh, commerce, as we know from one or two experiences in the past in this country, is almost always disastrous. The Pergal Dam resonates around in the United Kingdom for very good reasons. It, it is not the way of doing it. It may very well be that uh, a, a good project, properly financed, with proper returns on it, could attract a subsidy inside any country which allows for the poorer citizens of that country to have access to energy. I'm not arguing for a second that they should not do so, but the models have got to work. And when we describe the models, just to complete the point, when we describe the models to potential investors, we'd better have a really good story that stacks up. And I think that uh, with the greatest of respect to uh, uh, leaders of states, they, they, they need to think that through. Just as we need to stand in their shoes and understand them, they need to stand in investors' shoes and understand them. Thank you. Stephen, I have a, a, another question that I'd just like to direct to you, which is, do you think that the laws in the United States and the United Kingdom and other countries in particular, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the Bribery Act, the Proceeds of Crime Act, which has a whistleblower aspect to it that requires lawyers and accountants and, um, and financial advisors even to make uh, suspicious transaction reports to uh, authorities here in the UK. Do those laws help or hurt? Do they help or hurt? I think on, on balance they're, they're very good for increasing your transparency, but the most important thing that they do is on the supply side of the corruption equation, they make it understand very clear that there are real consequences for paying bribes and the challenge becomes how do you reduce the demand side where bribes are still being requested in certain instances or where business is being directed to consultants and other characters who, who may be challenging in, in certain environments. So the equation has changed, it's absolutely shifted, but there is still a distance to go, but the burden is now on doing your homework and there are real consequences if you don't. Thank you. And one more question from the, from the floor and then I'll open it up. Um, and this is, you e taxes yeah. strikes me as one of the key risks that any investor going into a country uh, would be concerned about and uh, from, from an investor standpoint, what you should be thinking about taxes and fiscal regimes? Um, well, at the end of the day, uh, this, that's the, at the heart of any commercial transaction. Um, no doubt about it, governments of the day are under pressure to increase their take. So at any possible opportunity, regulations will be, will be done to favor government. But any potential invest, investor, it's important that you get full knowledge of the full range of taxes, not just the regular company's income tax, but transactions taxes. Those are the ones that usually erode potential income. For instance, where you have withholding taxes, value-added taxes, and rest. But ultimately, what comes into play is the enforcement of um, the related regulation. The tone at the top may be very strong, the heads of states provide those stones at top, but the reforms at the civil le service level, the regulators, I mean the operators of that, that's where there needs to be significant game changers, as it were. Government civil service re reforms is important for um, that to be attractive, I mean, to be more attractive for a commercial perspective for investors in Africa. Thank you. Do we have, there's a gentleman over there. Yes, thank you. My name is William Asiko from ICF. Um, you know, protecting investor rights is at the heart of investment climate. And, you know, we talk a lot about corruption, infrastructure. I think that today, um, the perception of corruption is, much big, is a much bigger problem than the reality of corruption in Africa. In my work, I meet many government officials and they are fighting corruption as never before in Africa. I think a much bigger problem in Africa today is capacity, is the capacity of government to deal with all the uh, investment and the investors that uh, want to invest in their countries. And whether that capacity is around 
uh, as Bimpe said, in, in, in co commercial dispute uh, resolution mechanisms, whether that capacity is in tax collection, whether that capacity is in actually creating the predictability in reforms and policies that uh, are required to, to meet the growth needs that they, these countries have set for themselves. My question really is, and you know, to any of the panelists is, you know, how do you see this capacity issue being resolved? You know, how do you see, for example, you know, courts, you know, many of the courts today just don't have sufficient capacity to deal with the level of work that they, they have, leave alone the question of whether they are corrupt or efficient or objective. The, the, the sheer lack of capacity in African, many African governments today is, is a serious challenge. What are your thoughts on that? Thank you. That's an excellent question. I was thinking that since, since Bimpy is involved in putting together uh, capacity, maybe you want to address it first and maybe this is where you'd like to take okay. it after that. Um, yes, absolutely right. And if I was to ask a question or, or give advice to the African leaders that sat here today, that would be the main advice I would be giving is there does need to be a significant investment or increased investment in building capacity across sectors. And you know, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm talking about the whole dispute resolution framework, which is a major risk issue for any investors. Capacity around the judiciary, making sure the judges are better trained, making sure they're more aware of the global sort of um, legal dispute resolution mechanisms available, ensuring, again, as, as Cherie said, rule of law, and ensuring that lawyers and practitioners are better trained and the facilities are much more modern, infrastructure, communications. I think it's all about the, the government's investing in building capacity. And that's the message I would be sending to the leaders of Africa. Yes, I, I was going to add that um, not long ago I was um, in West Africa and I was, I was talking with the, um, the ministers in Sierra Leone and Liberia and uh, they, were, they were explaining the difficulties that they have. They have big companies coming, uh, extractive industry companies coming to their country wanting to negotiate uh, agreements, whether it's for electricity supply, for mining. They come with their, law their lawyered out. Your firm, I'm sure, is probably among them. They have huge numbers of lawyers on the other side. I hope so. You have the, you have the, attorney, you have the attorney general and a, a few civil servants from uh, countries which haven't had the experience of, of doing international transactions like this. Why would they when, when Africa hadn't been open up? And it's, it's a David and Goliath fight, really. And firstly, the negotiators on the other side have to understand that, yes, you can do a great contractual deal and give yourself all these advantages, but if you actually exploit the companies, the countries that you're working with, in the end, those investments are not going to be long-standing because the people and the government will, in the end, find out that they've been taken for a ride, and that's a bad thing. So we need to do more. In, in Omnia's strategy, when we, when we, we work with um, countries, or we are very much uh, in relation to arbitration, we always try to work with local partners, whether it's local law, law firm or with the civil servants in the Ministry of Justice, and, and try and actually do competence building as well. So that otherwise, it, it's great, of course, for people from outside Africa to turn up and, and to, to provide legal services. But in the end, it's essential, isn't it, that within Africa, you transfer the competences there so that they can um, contribute to their economies and to their countries. And uh, that's, that's really, really important. If I may just add, the gentleman from the ICF, I mean, I'm, I should actually have mentioned that the investment climbing facility has actually supported both the Lagos Court of Arbitration and the um, Kigali Court and given some significant grants and, um, that, and they're working with us in ensuring we're building capacity. I think we have time for just one quick question. Michael Amiswala. Um, CEO of Blue Square Minerals and Blue Square Oil and Gas. From the panel, just wanted to hear from yourselves what you think is key in terms of CSR in Africa. Thank you. So um, I think uh, we need to recognize that um, the investment world is changing, albeit slowly, internationally, and, and this will um, both affect Africa 
and also provide an opportunity. And that changes a shift from a focus on transactions to relationships. As we heard earlier, not to consider investment in Africa as a lottery or a casino, but rather longer term thinking. And, and that requires uh, more transparency, promotion of improved governance and corporate reporting to support integrated thinking within the companies themselves, as well as on the investor side. So I see a, a solution to this uh, in many parts, but to, to go with that global trend, thinking about the UN principles for responsible investment with, with um, $35 trillion signed up to the UN PRI now, uh, and make the most of that, uh, encouraging investors in by setting the bar higher, uh, requiring Im improved governance standards of companies and gaining confidence of investors and longer term behavior in that way. Thank you very much. I, I have just one very quick question for anybody in the panel, and that is uh, a black swan question. Uh, are there any, it seems to me we miss almost every risk that's out there all the time. We're constantly surprised what's happening in the world. Uh, we never get it right. Um, what is it out there that in particularly dealing in Africa that we're likely to miss um, in the near future? What's around the corner that people should be looking out for? <laughs> well, I'm not sure I want to tackle this one, but two, uh, two thoughts. One on the economic front, there is the possibility that there could be a real slowdown in demand from China that would have serious implications in Africa is one. And two, I don't think we can discount the possibility, even though we want to look at the world as constantly getting better, there are the possibilities that real violence flares up and that in a particular region, a set of actors wind up coming to be in charge of that region and cause some real trouble. And I would think northern Nigeria is one area that would give me real pause for concern. And Boko Haram, while it appears to be more contained, uh, could grow as a threat, one never knows. And as someone said to me yesterday, if Boko Haram was in the south of Nigeria, God, that would be a really big problem. Yeah. I'd, I'd add something about <coughs> women, actually, because, and it goes to what you were saying about Boko Haram. You know, the, the, the position of women in a society and the way they are treated and the way they are valued and the opportunities for women is often a very key indicator about the health of a society. Mm. And, um, you know, it's, it's not an optional extra to think, well, it's, you know, let's ignore what's happening to these young girls um, because it doesn't really matter. It's not an optional extra to think that child marriage is a, is a good <coughs> thing, that trafficking is a good thing. These are fundamental problems, and if you neglect these areas, then they will come back to haunt you. Uh, if I must add that, but put it, um, have a more positive spin on this, things will normally happen. For instance, this time last year, we're not sure about, I mean, nothing about Ebola or the consequences, but ultimately, uh, it just goes to emphasize the fact that you should have proper risk management framework in place to address this from a business perspective at the end of the day, both from the government perspective, how the systems you have can respond to these, then from a company perspective, always don't take any, anything for granted as it were. Can I, can I add just um, one thought, and it's, it goes along with a number of the things that have been said. Uh, when conflicts begin to emerge, and they can emerge with some speed as South Sudan demonstrated, it really does seem to me that the international community has to work a lot harder to try to resolve those problems of uh, conflict of, uh, of famine, of uh, insecurity, and to try and do it in a way which does not take so long that everybody ends up with an impression that you really can't operate in places where potentially, with a bit of speed and a bit of proper direction, you could operate. If I may just add, um, I think the black swan is here. Like you mentioned Ebola, I think it's, um, investors need to realize that it shouldn't always look at the low-hanging fruit where obvious um, returns, short-term returns are, are, are there, oil and gas, for example. Healthcare is a long-term investment, more capital intensive. But I think that if Africa and the investors coming to Africa don't actually look at investing in healthcare, the ramifications are, you know, the impact is such that it would affect any other sector. So the black swan is we should be looking at investing in long-term healthcare infrastructure in Africa. Very, very briefly, um, uh, climate change is clearly a, a known black swan. Um, 
but the impact on extractive industries and the stranding of assets under regulatory scenarios which limit the temperature rise would mean that much of the coal and oil deposits, deposits need to stay under the ground uh, and there would clearly be impacts on economies linked to that. Thank you. Our, our time is up. I'd just like to wrap up uh, by, uh, by mentioning or re reiterating a couple of things that I heard which I think are very important. One is that there's a lot for the governments to do to protect, uh, to protect investment rights, particularly long-term capital intensive investments where the investments go in first and the payout comes out um, later. But there's also a lot for investors to do. And the point about if your deal is too good, it's probably not going to work out, uh, has proven true time and again. Many of these investments are very important strategically to the country. They become very political. And if you have a long-term contract that just doesn't work, it'll break five years down the road, 10 years down the road. There's a rule, it's, a, it's, a, it's trite to say it. I'm also a native New Yorker. So there's the New York Times front page rule. If, you're, if you don't want what you're doing to show up on the front page of tomorrow's New York Times, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. But let me thank you very much. Uh, for this distinguished uh, group of panelists and the insights that they've um, provided. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>